The Atlantic hurricane season has officially begun and it will run from June to November. Mr. Abdiya Samuel, the National Disaster Coordinator at the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, is here to tell us all about it and some other things done by the agency that he heads. So, welcome Mr. Samuel to Good Morning SKM. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Here. Uh, it's a pleasure being here as well. Uh, it's fine. I've been watching the show now and again. So. Oh. It's nice to now come and have a discussion with you uh, well, and to your viewers. As well. It's good to see you in person. Yes. I know that <laughs> our viewers recognize your face yes. because yes. you have yes. been at the forefront of our right. fight against COVID-19. Yes. So I'd like to publicly say that it's a good job that thank your agency you. did in managing the task force. Yes. Yes. Thank so you thank you for so the work much. that you done. Thank you so much. We appreciate you guys for the job you are doing in terms of educating the general public, you know, mm. bringing different things to, to light, which is critical in terms of information and, you know, uh, education. Okay. It's, it's about setting a culture. Oh, Absolutely right. Thank you, thank, you, thank so you. We appreciate that. Yes. So without too much scientific details, what causes yeah. hurricane and why do they head our way? Well, it's important for us to know that uh, St. and Nevis, or geographical location at this, at this time, uh, makes us susceptible to hurricanes. Uh, so for five months, five to six months of the year, uh, we become under the threat of hurricanes. There's a combination of, of atmospheric activities uh, that causes hurricanes. Okay. And uh, just before coming here, I was in consultation with the senior med officer, Mr. Elmer Burke, where we were discussing the forecast we have been given by the Colorado State University, but most importantly, by the National Hurricane Center in the United States of America. And we know about the Ni El Nino and La Nina effect. And yeah. at this moment, uh, the prediction is based on La Nina effect. Okay. So meaning that we're going to have warm, sea, warm seas, okay. uh, which makes it more susceptible uh, to intensify the hurricanes or tropical activities. Mm -hmm. So then when you have the combination of warm uh, sea levels, moistures, uh, moistures in the atmosphere, as well as uh, disorganized systems, as well as uh, the wind mm -hmm. associated uh, off the west coast of Africa that drives uh, the, the hurricanes. All of these things combined together uh, causes these hurricane activities. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the <laughs> scientific <laughs> and <laughs> confuse people. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, basic. So uh, they have the wind, the warm, so you just imagine you have like this whirlpool just yeah. created in the seas and the wind around it going around and around and also you have some wind pushing it, the trade winds mm -hmm. pushing it. So eventually as you get warm, mm -hmm. then it intensifies. Okay. The winds intensify because it comes, becomes organized. Yeah. And from there on, then you have a system that would affect uh, okay. land, land mass. So why does all these Bad things have to be connoted to females because La Nina means girl. So why? He said El Nino too. <laughs> but, I, but at this point, it's not related to El Nino. It's related to La Nina. I won't comment. <laughs> Thank you. As, I do heard the same. As in disaster management, we have to be gender sensitive. Yes. Thank oh, you. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I love it. <laughs> I just had to put that out there. Definitely. Right, so definitely. a few years ago, I think that yes. all of us in the region here could appreciate the fact that hurricanes are not new to us. But okay. definitely when we had a Category 5 heading our way, I remember for the first time I was in my house and I heard what sounded like the pitter-patter of a million yeah. men. Yeah. Because that terrified me to the yes. point where I thought I was going to lose my roof. Yeah. So is there a distinction between you know a hurricane that's just normal maybe category one category two and a disaster type hurricane okay. and if so can you shed light on that wonderful wonderful so you know that in the caribbean region we use the uh Safiet, uh samson uh hurricane scale model uh what what is that so back in 1971 uh, there was a civil engineer named Safir, and there was a meteorologist named samson uh, he was the director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Okay. So they came up with some algorithms. And the algorithms were based on the measurement of the wind speed in the storm for one minute. Okay. So they measure the wind storm for one minute. And based on that, they look at the intensity. So each category would intensify by 10 times. Okay. That was the algorithm that they used. So we have category one. To category five so it's a scale from one to five 
So you start at anything over 74 miles an hour mm -hmm. to about 96 miles an hour is a category one where you would experience some damages. Okay. Not extensive damage, but okay. that, that sound what you said, it's consistent with that. Then if it intensifies more, then you move to a category two, which is from approximately 111 miles per hour sorry, from 95 miles per hour to 110 miles per hour, that's category two, where you will experience some extensive damage, wind damage, that is. Just imagine 90, somebody driving 95 miles an hour. Uh, yeah, if, yeah. if you've ever been on the highway in the United States sometimes, exactly. and you see these cars pass you at 80 miles per hour, yeah. you realize something there, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's Just imagine that with wind, yeah, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So then the category two, then you intensify to a category three, which is approximately 111 to approximately 130 miles per hour. Mm. Category, there you will have some what we call some devastating damage, mm. okay? or catastrophic damage. Okay. Category four now, you are looking at that, it's intensifying at 10 times that. So it's gonna move from 131 miles an hour to approximately 156 miles an hour. Mm. Anything now over that's category four, mm -hmm. where those are now you know devastating, mm -hmm. very devastating. This is where you're gonna you feel your roof coming off. Mm -hmm. You're gonna lose shingles. You're gonna lose doors. You're gonna lose windows if you're not properly you know. And even if you something have them properly bad off, then you're gonna lose something. And then you could actually see shrubs, trees being actually pulled out of the ground, rooted up, rooted, and you see them become flying projectile. And any loose items that you have around. I don't know if you have ever seen lampposts, actually metal lampposts bent yeah. by no, these winds. It's, oh, yeah, I'm so sure. those things are it's so powerful. But then we reach to a category five, and we have uh, seen the experiences of what a category five can do to any land mass that is populated or unpopulated. And we have the experiences of Oma and Maria, whereby in less than 24 hours, yeah. in less than a few hours, they intensified from a category two, three, to a category five, mm -hmm. devastating Dominica uh, back in 2017. So we, we have seen the intensification of these into category five. Mm -hmm. So category five now is anything in excess of 156 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I don't know if you want to say, because Superintendent Henry might be watching you, but <laughs> I don't know if any one of us here can drive 156 miles per hour an, an hour on our streets. You could imagine the sheer speed of that. Yes. Yeah. So that's, those are the category, yeah. and those are some of the damages that you can uh, uh, expect okay. with those categories. Okay. Uh, what, what I love about the, the, this year, we have a prime minister actually, as, as in here, yes. Gaston. Yeah? Gaston, So yes. I, I think Antigua and Barbuda, as I was teasing my colleagues, Sherrod James over there, they, they have to prepare. Obviously. Yeah? They have to prepare, yes. right. But so if they prepare, we are the own, they are the own neighbors, so we have to prepare in yes. St. Yes. as well. So yes, the National Hurricane Center has advised that we should expect in the Atlant 2022 Atlantic hurricane season, uh, 14 to 21 named storms. Okay. Six to ten of those will become hurricane. Out of those six to ten, mm -hmm. three to six will become major hurricanes, meaning that they are going to be category three and up. Mm -hmm. So that's upwards of 111 miles per hour wind speed, mm -hmm. up to one, yeah, 156, yeah. uh, even higher. There is also a discussion that the scientists are having that maybe we need to look at a category six because they feel due to the climate situation and mm -hmm. challenges, uh, we may have to increase the category because we are going to see storms intensify mm -hmm. as we move along if we continue with this uh, global warming. That is alarming. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. So that, that is what we're expecting. In the Caribbean region now, and, and we are seeing in the Northeast in particular, uh, the CIMH um, has advised us basically, uh, they are not a forecasting, but they are the ones who give us you know, hydrology and meteorology. And they, what they have said is that we are facing some heavy drought situation in the Northeast in particular. I don't know right now if uh, many citizens, uh, if you know, but many citizens are facing 
um, water challenges in St. Kitts and yes, Nevis. by 8 o'clock. By 8 o'clock, yeah. you see that we have to ration water in order for us to sustain our water wells. Yes. That in itself can become a, a, a compound crisis for us here in St. Kitts and Nevis. So we have been in discussion with the water department and the other critical mm -hmm. uh, agencies such as environment and others uh, to look at how do we uh, build resiliency in this area. Mm -hmm. Because it impacts everything. No, why is this important? Because uh, the warming that we are experiencing uh, is conducive to tropical storms, which then becomes hurricanes. And uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis in particular, we have to prepare. Mm -hmm. We have been spared for the past few years. We have not been impacted by a hurricane for the past seven to eight years. Good stuff. In 2017, we were not impacted. I want to make that clear. We were not impacted. We were affected by the passage of yeah, okay. Oma and Maria. And we saw what that did to us. Okay. We now have to prepare for a potential direct impact. Okay. So if we want to be a resilient nation, where the lives and livelihoods and the economy of our country is resilient, we have to prepare. Okay. We have to listen to the authorities. Uh, we are being guided by experts throughout the world. Uh, we are in consultation on a regular basis. We have our parent company, which is Sidimo the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and they are providing guidance for us to be able to prepare our, our, our countries. Uh, they call them participating states. We have to prepare. That's the reality. This is not about fear. This is about reality. Prepare Just a follow-up question uh, yeah. before you jumps yes. in. Uh, the follow-up question to me is, what is your gauge for preparedness? Mm -hmm. Is there one? Great. Um, we look at the impact uh, from a socioeconomic level. We have to look at the social safety nets that are in place for the, most, for the marginalized uh, back and, and, and running, operational, in a short period of time. That is what will give us the resilience and put us at a competitive edge, okay. we being a, a, a tourism-based country. Mm -hmm. We have to take that into consideration. Sure. And through COVID, which I'll hopefully get a few minutes to tell you about, that taught us, uh, taught us a big lesson. Okay. Undoubtedly. Yeah. So you, we speak about preparedness. Yes. I want to touch on the shelters. Okay. Where are the shelters located? And you also speak on immigrants. Yes. And we know we have yes. a large Spanish-speaking population. Yes. The French is yes. slowly growing. Yeah. At these centers, would they be persons that speak Will they be bilingual persons, let me put it that way? And can you tell us where the shelters are located around okay. the island? Wonderful. So the shelter list, as it is right now, uh, is the shelter list from 2021. Okay. The 2022 shelter uh, is not finalized as yet. Okay. This is how the process goes. So uh, in February, we have what you call the Housing and Shelter National Subcommittee. Okay. This subcommittee comprises of uh, experts in that area, structural engineers, public works, uh, other individuals who have that capacity. What they do is that collab in collaboration with our district volunteer mechanism, which is the strongest, one of the strongest arms of NEMO, they go out there and they assess a number of, of buildings, physical buildings, they go out there, and they identify those as potential shelters, whether they are, be, they are private or public, meaning they belong to private persons yes. or they belong to the state. Yes. Once those are agreed upon and they feel they are habitable, that persons can go there. It's not a hotel, let me make sure. I tell you, it's not a hotel, <laughs> but they can go there and they can be there yeah. for, a, for a few days, yes. okay? Then they, they, we, we meet, we discuss, and we create the list, it goes to cabinet, and then cabinet approves. Okay. And then we post that and we send it to um, a number of institutions and we put it on the various social media platforms. Okay. Individuals will now know uh, we are in districts because St. Kitts and Nevis is divided into districts. Okay. Well, in Nevis we use parishes, but in St. Kitts we use district. And what we use is the electoral boundaries to differentiate district. So you know that constituency one is district one. Okay. Constituency two is district two. So that is go we go around. So we have eight districts in St. Kitts and five parishes in Nevis. Okay. So in each district we have what you call a primary shelter and we have the secondary shelters. The primary shelters is the main shelters where persons can go, okay? Now, in each district, we, try to, we do try to have sufficient shelters for the number of persons uh, who live or reside in that district. 
so we have the information from the statistics department according to the population housing and population census and that is what we use to uh, guide us in terms of the statistics knowing how many persons reside in these areas so it's a very extensive process now the reality is we do not have sufficient uh, physical space to house everyone. That's the reality. I'm just being frank with the general public, and this is something I have spoken to with the authorities. Okay. Now, at present, we have capacity for about 2,000 2, persons. I have to find space for another 8,000 persons because then we need to have the capacity for approximately 10,000 persons. Okay. No, so what is the contingency to that? The contingency to that is that we first advocate for the, what we call the body system, be your neighbor's keeper. Okay. So if my house is stronger and I have a little room that could allow my neighbor who has a little shack, yeah. I would allow my neighbor to shelter yeah. until the state can come in and assist the neighbor. Okay. The reason why we have uh, limited shelter space is because we, don't, we have adopted a policy in St. Kitts and Nevis not to use schools as shelters based on the after action review that has been done on impacted Caribbean countries, such as Dominica and other places, regarding using schools as shelters. We need to get the children refocused and back into school as soon as possible. If we keep them out too long, then we have been informed through UNICEF and others that uh, the, the psychosocial impact on the children and that came out of, out of Dominica is critical. So in order to, for us to work against that, we need to get them back on the piers where they could go back and play and take their minds off of the, the impact of the hurricane, yeah. the howling winds, as you spoke, and, and so on. Dominica, children that had to be placed inside of cabinets and so on to shelter, yeah. uh, it had, it had a, a, a devastating psychological impact on them up to today. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, based on the after action review, St. Vincent from the uh, effusive volcanic eruption and the sheltering of these persons that were displaced, they had difficulties getting them out of the shelters. Mm. Difficulty. And guess where they were? Schools. Schools, yeah. So you've looked at other places, you've gotten yes. lessons, and you're saying we're not going to do that. We're not gonna yes, do that the makes schools. perfect sense. Uh, before we let you go, because there's a lot to talk <laughs> yes. about with you clearly, and I feel like we are <laughs> nearly out of time if we're not already. Yes. But I do want to give you a few moments to speak to some of the lessons learned about COVID, as you mentioned. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. So, you know, uh, Sinkis and Nevis, based on the intensity that we have in, for planning, in planning for hurricane seasons and, and other um, uh, emergencies, because we are not just hurricane centric. We have adopted what you call the CDM strategy, which is the Comprehensive Disaster Management Strategies, where we, are, we go an all-hazard approach in managing uh, emergencies or uh, disasters, so to speak, or managing crisis as well. Uh, because of that, we were able to use uh, the existing plan for what we were developing for Ebola to implement and respond appropriately to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was last experienced over 100 years ago. And the skill sets that we had in the island that a lot of people sometimes take for granted, we were able to harmonize them in forming a task force. And this task force, having experts from the medical field, uh, the security forces, and many other, the many other environment and many other places, we were able to guide the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis through a historic crisis that I'm not sure if in our lifetime we will be able to, we will face experience again, again or experience again. Yeah. And the, the commitment, the professionalism uh, of our, our team, the team dynamic, it will, not, it will never be perfect, mm -hmm. but it was great enough yes, for us to guide uh, the, the individual, guide this country through the crisis. We actually, our motto was to place the people first, mm -hmm. everything after. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we build resiliency in, in the life of individual as well as the livelihoods. And from that, it has given, up, given us a perspective in terms of what we need to do infrastructure-wise, mm -hmm. in terms of building knowledge and capacities, in the accessing of uh, resources, establishing networks with a bilateral agreements with countries. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I can tell you the United States in the early stages, I remember being summoned by the Prime Minister, along myself and Dr. Laws as the CMO, 
and other officials, the Attorney General and others, where we had to go in a meeting because the United States wanted uh, the factory to be opened, to produce parts that they needed for the response to COVID. And it was so, for me, I mean, the experience like no other, when the Prime Minister said, okay, call this number, when we call the number, it was the White House. Mm. And, you know, yeah. uh, going through that process and speaking with the White House right there with the Prime Minister, I think that too uh, was excellent. And the Prime Minister gave us uh, that, that, that space, let me put it that way, for us to be able to work and as technical people and the astute leadership in, in, in the cabinet as well as the prime minister in allowing us mm -hmm. to guide them from the technical aspect and listening to the expert advice and acting accordingly and supporting it, that made it significantly easy for us to. Come.